the law Approaching me for answers Summoning a song She questioned me at daybreak Where do you go in dreams? I said ask of anything But not the things you've seen I'm a musician. I put my philosophy into writing songs up until this point, and I present my music in performance. And I also practice my philosophy in something I call audience inclusion. I take my music beyond traditional venues, and I go to venues that are traditionally overlooked as well. And the last two CDs that I've produced have both been greatly influenced by the appearance of Alice the canine Messiah, <laughs> who came into my life in 2005. And it's important to me, we just finished up a book, and it's important as we go out to promote the book, because it involves a lot of Alice's philosophy for life, it's important to be entertaining for a couple reasons. One is, all the world's a stage. I'm here to stage the show of my lifetime, so to speak. And the other reason is that there are far too many philosophical speakers who are intent on persuading us or inspiring us to do or say what they do or say or what some dead person did or said. <laughs> and I think the world needs more entertaining philosophical speakers. So that's important to us. Because you see, philosophy is simply a way of looking at the world. It's a point of view. And when we go to the theater, for example, to see an evening of Shakespeare, we don't, we aren't expected to join a society that says, well, Shakespeare's the only true playwright. It's simply a theater company that enjoys Shakespeare, and they enjoy sharing the Shakespeare experience, and you go and indulge them for the evening. And so, much the same way, I've come to share a point of view with the world that was shared with me by Alice a few years ago when we first met. And honestly, at 47 years old, I'd never heard of even thinking of looking at the world this way. She gave me something called the one exercise. So we're going to talk about that, but tonight, I'd like to tell you the story of how I came to meet Alice, the canine Messiah. <laughs> See, in 2005, I was in Buckingham County, way back in the middle of nowhere. Someone had asked me to go to a house and provide a price opinion on the house. So I'm driving down these dusty gravel roads, on and on, and I come to what's going to be the next to last bend in the road before the house. I don't know that. I come around a bend, and up ahead, I see a table, like a little card table and a sign. And my first thought, there were no people there, my first thought was, there's a lemonade stand out here, oh, I'll get a glass, right? But there were no people there. But I was curious. And as I got closer, this little dog stands up and watches me come in. She's a miniature picture. She's got this dog. So I slowed down then, because I didn't see people, but I saw a dog, and she had a leash, and she was hooked to the table, and so I got out and said, how you doing, little girl? <laughs> and I looked around, and I saw the sign. I saw the sign. The Messiah is in. And so I laughed, and I was like, well, what did the Messiah, like, leave you here? Is the Messiah coming back to get you? I mean, it's feasible for me to take you with me. And then I saw the note. There was a rock there. And it was on a piece of paper, and there was a pencil. And I saw the note, and I looked at the note up, and it said, Thanks for stopping. Please take care of my dog. I had to leave in a hurry. She's one of a kind. She's a real, real sweetheart. Thank you. No phone number, no name, no I'll be back next week, no nothing. So I grabbed the pencil, and I wrote, I don't think your note was for me, but I've got your dog. It's getting dark, and here's my phone number. My name's Greg. So I let her off the table. I took the leash, let her off the table, walked her around. She jumped in the car, drove up. Right around the bend was the house. I did my business, took a photograph, left the note there, said I found this cute little dog. Call me. And then we headed back. We were about four or five miles away, headed back towards Charlottesville, along these gravel roads still, and it's very quiet. And I'm coming to a stop sign, I'm petting the dog, and suddenly, just clears the bell, I hear, Alice. I'm thinking, I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear it again, Alice. And before I could even think again, I just looked at the dog and said, oh, is your name Alice? 
she didn't answer. <laughs> but in the silence, I remember Aunt Alice, my friend neighbors, Aunt Alice, at Heritage Hall, the first place I ever practiced audience inclusion. She was half of my audience, <laughs> Aunt Alice. And she showed me that every audience is the best, that music transcends all the differences between people. And she's really a big part of the reason why I practice audience, audience inclusion today and why I advocate it. Yes, Alice. Hi, Alice. I'm Greg. And I thought to myself, you probably already know that. <laughs> That's really weird. So a couple weeks, within a couple weeks, we knew nobody was calling. I'm getting this dog. She was coming to live with us. And I started having these dreams, these recurring dreams. And those pine trees, it wasn't a forest at all. There was just this thin veil of trees, and there was this lake on the other side, this huge body of water, like a great lake here in Virginia. And this submarine would come up out of this lake, right to that house I visited. And Alice gets out of the submarine, and she wasn't alone, and she knew I was coming. And then the submarine takes off into the sky. Right? And the lights on the belly are really bright, and that's what would wake me up from the dream for like ten nights in a row. And there would be Alice lying there in bed, just like looking at me, that little stub of the chaos. <laughs> so that's how I came to meet Alice. And there's an awful lot more to tell you about Alice. Our book will be out soon. And we'll get to that after a short break. That's it for now. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>